Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this special episode of Voice of the Sea, we'll take a look at some of the stories we'll tell this year. We'll be in American Samoa, learning about life in this Polynesian paradise. We'll see how traditional values are maintained on a village level with the chief. Then we'll talk to an ethnographer about documenting the culture of Samoa. We'll learn what it takes to manage a nature preservation and how they're fighting an outbreak of invasive ocean predators. We'll also learn about the importance of tattooing in Samoan culture. Finally, we'll look at diving technology scientists are using to do their work under the waters of American Samoa. In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're on the island of Tutuila in American Samoa. First, we're talking about village life in American Samoa. Kanisa talks with the mayor of Amuli Village about Samoan village traditions. And we attend a village meeting where climate change and fishing pressures are changing how locals manage their resources. And this is the village of Amuli? This is the village of Amuli. And you're the mayor here? I am the mayor, yes. What does that mean? The mayor? Yeah. Well, it's just like... Uh, uh, guardian of the village, like uh, the protector of the village, mm -hmm. and just make sure that everything is um, perfect. I'm the one that always walk in the village, make sure you know everything is clean, everything is in order. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know people obey the, the village curfew because we have curfew every evening. At what time? About 6:30. Oh wow. And then we have one at night at 9.30 for the, for the kids, school kids. Uh-huh. Because yeah, the, if the bell ring at 9.30, and, I mean, all the kids that go to school has got to go to bed. Time for bed, to go to school the next morning. I see. And, uh, you know, I'm the one who represents the village in the, in the government. If they have their, if, if the government wants something from the village, they always approach me first. Uh-huh. Come to me first, then I go to the village. So what is the meeting today then? Well, it discussed uh, cause, uh, uh, about three weeks ago, there was a problem in our village. Some kids, because uh, in this village, we have, we have a, a very strict curfew. Uh -huh. No yelling in the village, no fighting, no stealing, everything like that. So about three weeks ago, there was a couple of kids in the village. They were swearing and yelling in the village. So we had a meeting today, and then and the village decided to uh, punish them in the village way. Uh -huh. So the village government decided to fine them like four case of chicken. <laughs> yeah, four case of chicken, and they have to feed the, the village council. Okay, uh, tell off everybody. I tell my more more. Um, I'll just uh, reintroduce myself. My name is uh, Trevor Kaitu. Um, I work for the um, Coral Reef Advisory Group, and I function as the uh, Education and uh, Outreach Coordinator for the Coral Reef uh, Advisory Group. Now, our main aim and objectives is to preserve and conserve the coral reef ecosystem for the benefit of the people of uh, American Samoa, United States, and the rest of the world. Uh, today, I will just basically uh, talk to you about uh, coral reefs. In this episode, we talk to ethnographer Micah van der Rijn of the Samoan Studies Institute. Micah explains what it is to be an ethnographer 
as he catalogs the legends, history, and customs of everyday life in Samoa. We'll also see excerpts from his documentary about Muliaba, otherwise known as Rose Atoll. First, let's meet Micah in his office at the Samoan Studies Institute. This is the work area where I work. It's an ethnographic media laboratory. Come on in and take a look. Oh, nice. At the moment, I'm working on a editing, final editing of a film about the uh, Muyava, otherwise known as the Rose Atoll, which lies at the easternmost end of the Samoan archipelago. American Samoan Department of Education supports three elementary schools and one high school in Manua to serve Manua's children. Those wishing to pursue higher education or employment opportunities not available in Manua must leave for Tutuila and beyond. This pattern has led to a dramatic decline in the local population. Air and ship transport between Tutuila and Manua are limited. Ferry service on the MV Sili is at best once per week. Air transport in small planes is also not reliable. Importing and exporting supplies is a challenge. This means that the people who remain in quieter and more tranquil Manua must enjoy a way of life more reliant on traditional food sources from the sea and land. Most people in Manua participate in fishing, and fish is an important component of the Manua diet. We started training people how to document their own culture for the sake of heritage preservation for the future, particularly um, nowadays with all the imported television, the, um, there's less storytelling. You know, there's a huge, rich rapport of oral history and traditions that are told, and there used to be a tradition of telling them at night from older generation to younger generation. But now that that has declined because of such things as television, as well as modern education, and the value of it is harder to um, realize. So this program was to document and put it in the film form and actually get some of that on the television as well as in the classroom so that the heritage can continue. Some traditional manua fishing techniques are still being continued. For example, the use of the enu for the fishing of the iasina, or goldfish, a technique involving this traditional fishing weir, and also the lawatule, the collective fishing of the seasonal mackerel under the direction of a chief fisherman called Matuo Tautai. Using coconut leaves that have been tied together, the men encircle the school of fish that visit seasonally. The fish are corralled into a special giant woven basket, which is hauled onto the beach. The multitudes of fish are brought up to the land to be counted. After that, they are carefully distributed to all the members of the village under the supervision of the chiefs. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, Improving Schools, Improving Education. CRDG. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we learn about the pristine environment of Rose Atoll with Monument Manager Frank Pendleton. Frank works with scientists from NOAA to measure the environmental health of Samoa's Rose Atoll. First, Frank explains the protection status on Rose Island. It's the Rose Atoll Wildlife Refuge and National Marine Monument, is that right? Right, we've got two places right there at the same place. There's uh, right up tight around the atoll is Rose Atoll National Wildlife Refuge. And out 50 nautical miles from there is Rose Atoll Marine National Monument. The refuge encompasses everything inside the red line, which outlines Muliava's reef in this aerial photo. Its two islets, Rose Island and the Barren Sand Island, comprise 20 acres. The lagoon, 1,600 acres. 
Closure to the public is designed to protect the fragile ecosystems of the atoll. Permission of visitation must be obtained from the Office of Rose Atoll National Wildlife Refuge in Pangopango. Despite this protection, a Taiwanese longliner tuna fishing boat ran aground on the atoll's outer reef in 1993, causing major ecological damage to the reef and its marine organisms on which the birds are also reliant. The waters were contaminated with thousands of gallons of diesel and loop oil. Decomposition of the iron hull in the water led to an outbreak of harmful algae which killed the coral. The reef is now recovering thanks to efforts from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the American Samoa Department of Marine and Wildlife Resources to remove the 250 tons of iron off the reef. So as the wildlife refuge manager, what do you do? I'm the first ever refuge manager for here, which is... Oh, a, wow. Yeah, it's a very lucky thing. Yeah, it's a, a variety of things. It's, and it's very different from one refuge to the next. And I have the, you know, the, the luck of having a very unique refuge. Counting our birds, uh, tagging our turtles so we know where they're going, and you know, who else we can talk to about helping to conserve our turtles and whatnot. And that's everything for that. But we also have the monument you know, at the same time. So that's a lot of, since it's such a new thing, is talking with our partners. We work a lot with the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Sanctuary Program, the Department of Marine and Wildlife Resources from the territory here, and also the Department of Commerce from the territory. So getting everyone together so we can all manage this place as one unit together. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. But a lot of the day-to-day -day is much more, as you see around here, computer and meetings and whatnot. In this episode, we visit the Marine National Park in American Samoa with ecologist Tim Clark. We'll be doing some underwater surveying, looking for outbreaks of the crown of thorn starfish, which is devastating reefs across the Pacific. Tim and his team are also mapping fish habitat in the park, and he'll talk about the tools and technology they use in their dives. First, we meet Tim's team and get some background on the crown of thorns and the Marine National Park in American Samoa. Tim, we're right on the edge of the National Park now. Correct, we just got here. Um, we're at the end of the National Park, and today what we're doing is we're looking for crown of thorns is our primary objective. Okay, so tell me about the crew you got on board today, Captain Tim. We've got a great crew on board today, Nisa. Uh, we had Tasi here, he's gonna be our boat driver. Tossi started off with our terrestrial crew, also worked on trails, and now he's come over to the marine side. So it's great having him. Uh, he's in charge of our boating program. He maintains all of our boats and our gear, and is also our main boat driver. Uh, our other crew member here is Bert. Say hi, Bert. <laughs> uh, Bert's been working for the park for the marine program for three years now. Going to four. Going to four years, so almost four years. Uh, Bert's great. Uh, he really knows his fish and he really knows his coral. Uh, he's probably the best on island with fish and coral ID. Um, he's in charge of our inventorying and monitoring, our benthic surveys. So he does all of our coral IDs when we do our yearly benthic surveys. So we're going to take the scooters down. Scooters are going to jet us along on the bottom so we can cover a lot more area than we would just kicking with ourselves on uh -huh. our fins. Um, but we also need to know where we're going. So we're going to be towing behind us a, a float, uh, one of the lifeguard floats, torpedo buoy, and on it we're going to have a GPS. And that GPS is set on track mode. So every 15 seconds, it logs where we are on the reef. You don't need to press a button or anything. It does it automatically. It's all done automatically. So as we tow, tow it through the water behind us, 15 second intervals, it's taking our location. Actually, I, I thought that was a pretty neat dive. <laughs> yeah, it actually went really well. Uh, we saw no crown of thorns, which is good. Good. Very good. Uh, so, so far, we've seen no crown of thorns in the National Park, 
which we're really excited about. We have seen a lot of them outbreak levels on the south side of the island. Uh -huh. So now that we've done surveys in the park and shown they're not here, we're going to really switch our efforts over to trying to control the ones outside the park. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're at NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary Ocean Center in American Samoa. The center is a learning facility and promotes stewardship and environmentalism in Samoa. We'll learn about American Samoa's environmental challenges like the Crown of Thorns outbreak and the Samoan people's connection to the ocean through the use of tattoo symbolism. So, welcome to the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa exhibit room. People want to go and dynamite the reefs. They don't see the connection that the reefs are important for an mm -hmm. ecosystem to survive. So our sanctuary allows you to fish, but it's how you fish mm -hmm. is what we're concerned about. So no dynamiting, no poisons, no anchoring. So you're not disturbing the reef habitat. We have our remote um, islands and through presidential proclamation, this is really Rose Atoll National Marine Monument. Uh -huh. But when we went through public hearings, uh, the Manu'a people know it as Muliava. And if you look at this model, this is a larval dispersal model. Oh, wow. So it shows you where coral and fish lay their eggs. And based on the currents, these travel someplace. What does that mean? We're seeding. We're seeding these Pacific areas. So depending how long the fish, the coral eggs last in its conditions, you know, in the water, the, the climate, we could be seeding Cook Islands, you know, so we could be seeding Samoa. And based on the currents and the seasons, we knew this from our past generation. Mm -hmm. Muliava, translated, is the end of the South Equatorial Current. Really? So it's the end of the current. And the tattooing process, you said traditionally, does it, it happens over a long time or do they do it all at one time? It happens over a um, period of uh, maybe two weeks, depending on the strength of the person that's getting the tattoo. And if it's done the traditional way, it's rather painful and, and they need to take a break in between, like maybe three hours straight break and then another three hours. And by the traditional way, how do they apply the tattoo? The, uh, it, they use the, the, the shark teeth at the end of a little um, a stick and they tap it. They dip it into the ink, take it out and tap it. Oh, wow. Yeah, they tap it and that's the pain, that's, I reckon that's more painful than <laughs> the needle. You know how uh -huh. this was done traditionally and 20 minutes of uh, excruciating pain. But after a while... What does your tattoo it, mean? It means the waves of the ocean. So, yeah, nice. it's very interesting. Everything we do here, most of the things that are all always connected to the ocean. In this episode, we're talking about diving technology. We're talking rebreathers, mixed gas, scuba, nitrox, and underwater scooters. Ecologist Tim Clark shows off the tools he uses to study fish and reef health in the National Park of American Samoa. These new technologies are allowing scientists to stay down longer, get closer, and learn more about the marine environment. All right, so this is your dive setup here. Uh, so this is kind of the heart of a lot of what we do, is actually producing gases for the dive. Thought we would talk about tanks yeah. and, um, you know, different sizes and what we use them for. You know, Tim, I, I scuba dive and stuff, but um, one of the things that's always kind of fascinated me is just the tank itself, like how does it work? How does it keep all that air in there? And you go get them checked out so they make sure they're still working. What are they looking for? And how do you know that the tank's doing its job? <laughs> so the tank is a, either an aluminum or a steel cylinder that you pump gas in and you just 
push a whole bunch of gas in here. Um, so this is an 80 cubic foot um, aluminum scuba tank. And uh, this one in particular is one that we fill with nitrox. So this has an elevated percentage of oxygen. And basically it has a valve on it here. This is an on-off valve. Mm -hmm. This is a little cap here. Um, it has an opening that the air comes out of. So you turn the valve on. And that's the air coming out. Um, so this allows us to take the air down with us. Uh, we can put a regulator on here, uh, which is an apparatus that lets us breathe off of this tank. So mm -hmm. it's something you know that has a little hose, connects to a piece that we can put on our mouth, and then breathe this air underwater. Um, or this is gas nitrox. Uh, so depending on what we're doing, we're going to have different sizes of tanks. And you can see we have, uh, these, are, <laughs> these are big. Uh, this is twin aluminum 80 cylinders. So these two tanks are actually bolted together? Correct, these two are bolted together. Um, and then it has a manifold connecting them so that you can uh, share the air between these two tanks. So this is a little isolator valve here. If we open this up, uh, we can put a regulator on one of these and then open both these valves and we'll be able to breathe both tanks off one regulator. Mm -hmm. Typically we put a regulator on both of them so if we have problems with one, we can switch to the other. So this gives us both more air underwater, but it also gives us redundancy. So it gives us a little bit of extra safe safety uh, because if there's a problem with one tank, we can switch to the other and still come up to finish our dive. Pressure is how much air is in the tank. So as you push air in, it's creating more and more pressure. So the more air you push in, it's kind of like you're trying to fill a balloon. Uh -huh. You know, you blow up a balloon. At first, it's pretty easy. You have very low pressure. But as you get bigger and bigger, it's harder and harder to blow into that balloon. Well, that's because there's more and more gas in there. Um, for a balloon, though, it expands out. Right. So it can release some of that pressure. If you're trying to fill a tank, it doesn't expand like a balloon. So you generate a lot more pressure in a tank. Uh, for these tanks, typically, we fill them to 3,000 PSI, which is pounds per square inch, um, which is quite a bit of pressure. Ecologist Tim Clark demonstrates rebreather diving and talks about how the technology is different than traditional scuba diving. We learn how the rebreather filter works to recycle air, allowing divers to stay underwater for longer periods of time and even to feel more refreshed after surfacing. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant.